Hello, I'm Russ Morris, and I'm happy to welcome you to worship today. Here's a couple of things I would want to share with you. Please let us know you're worshiping with us today. It helps us know who we're connecting with and who we may have lost in touch with. So please pull out your phone and send a message to 281-305-1069. If this is your first time to worship with us, type the word welcome. If you've been with us before, just type the word here. After you send the message, you'll receive a follow-up text to click a link and fill out your connection card with us today. This is in place of passing the connection cards each Sunday, and it really helps us out. Thanks for letting us know you're here. Now is the time to try out a Bible study. We have two groups about to start, both meeting online through Zoom. Abby's group on Sundays at 4 p.m. is about to start a study on the Psalms, and Linda's group on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. is about to start a study on the Old Testament stories. If you would like to give either of these a try, contact the church office and we'll get you the links. If you're worshiping with us on Facebook, say hello in the comments and let us know you're here. Welcome to Worship with Asbury. Well, good morning. It's so good to be in worship with you today, whether you're here in the sanctuary or if you're joining us from home. I'm so happy to be able to uh, take this time that like we do every week uh, to remember who we are and whose we are and who really the whole world belongs to. And so I'm really happy that we can worship together today. Today, I wanted to um, take a moment and say thank you to all of our church leaders who served over the past year. At Asbury, we tend to have a three-year rotation to the majority of our ministry team. And so every year we have some folks who fulfill their three-year commitment, and then they roll off of those teams, and we have new folks who come on to them. So for just one moment, I would like to say a big thank you to everyone who helped us uh, engage in ministry for the kingdom of God over the last year. It was a crazy year. It was different. And yet we had so many church leaders step up and make sure that God's work was not sidelined through this church. So first, I want to say thank you to everyone who served on those teams this year. I also want to take a moment uh, as, you know, we're kind of at the close of the first uh, month of the year to say a prayer of blessing over everyone who will be serving in leadership this year. From the Leadership Council, uh, which is responsible for many of the major decisions of our church, on down to the members of every single one of our teams, um, each one of these folks uh, makes a big difference in terms of fulfilling God's calling for our church. So will you please join me for a moment in praying for this year's leaders? Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for reminding us what is at the center, what really matters. Today, we lift up uh, the leaders of our church to you, Lord, for the year of ministry ahead. We pray that you give them the wisdom of Solomon as they make decisions on your behalf, Lord. We pray that you lead them with the Holy Spirit. We pray that when they encounter challenges and when they feel weak, Lord, that they would be able to uh, fall on you and that you would give them perseverance and endurance. We pray, Lord, that each of our ministry teams and every person who serves on them would be obedient to you in keeping with the teachings of Scripture. And we pray, Lord, that you would give each of us courage to lay down every personal preference for the cause of Christ. We pray these things and a word of blessing on each one of our leaders today. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Please join us in our opening hymn today. If you're at home, sing along with us. If you're in the sanctuary, stand as you're able. This hymn is about the faith of all the leaders, the men and women who have come before us in our worship. So please stand and sing praises to them.
Good morning, friends. If you are here in the sanctuary, you can come up here to the front and join me. I want to say hello to all of our friends worshiping at home. Oh my goodness, look at all these friends I have during this early service. It's so great to have you guys here. I'm going to need help today, too. So, Okay, so I want all of you guys to turn and ask the congregation to touch their heads. And those of you at home, ask your family to touch their heads. Ready? Go. Touch your heads. All right. So, did we know for sure that everyone would touch their heads? No, we didn't know that, right? But we still asked because you trusted me and did what I asked, right? So today's scripture is from Ezekiel in the Old Testament, and it isn't a story of success like you'd think. God commanded Ezekiel to go and speak to the people of Israel who were very stubborn and hard-headed and not listening to God. God told Ezekiel to fill himself up with the scroll, which was God's word. Ezekiel had to take the word of God himself first so that he could go and speak the word of God to the people. Now, Ezekiel was warned that the people would not listen to him, but he was still obedient and followed through on what God asked of him anyway. God already knew that this was going to be a difficult mission for Ezekiel. The people of Israel didn't listen to God, and they sure weren't about to listen to Ezekiel either. But whether they listened or not, Ezekiel went and talked to them because this is what the Lord God asked him to do. Kind of like when I asked you to turn to the congregation and touch their heads. So no matter how the people reacted, Ezekiel was to go on with his work and then leave the results to God. What really mattered and what pleased God was that Ezekiel delivered his message faithfully, not whether or not the people actually listened. So there is power in being faithful. We act and believe that God will take care of us even though we can't see what he's up to or where he's taking us. Faith is listening to God and trusting that he will help us and lead us where we should go. So when God asks us to do something, we don't always know how it'll work out, right? Just like not everyone here probably touched their heads, and we have no way of knowing how many people at home touched their heads. However, because we love God, we trust him. And that's why it's important to be faithful, even if we aren't guaranteed success. And God gives us chances to practice trusting him, and he asks us to try new things, like maybe telling a friend about Jesus. It may be hard, and people may not listen to us, but we're showing God that we trust and obey him, even though it's tough. And if we remain faithful to God, he will use us in ways that we can't even imagine. So today is Commitment Sunday. And for you guys at home, this is on our children's Facebook page. And there's some copies here in the church. And it's where you can make a pledge to work hard at being a disciple of Jesus, to worship, grow, serve, and share. There's many different things you can do with this pledge. And God doesn't ask you to be perfect with this pledge. He just wants you to try and remain faithful to him. For example, you may ask several of your friends to come to church with you as part of your discipleship pledge. And all of those friends may say no, but you stayed faithful to him, and that's what it's all about, just like Ezekiel did in the Old Testament. Will you pray with me now? Dear God, thank you for Ezekiel who shows us how to be faithful, even though things may not turn out like we want. Help us follow the discipleship pledge and follow you in all parts of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and together we all say, Amen. There's worship bags out in the lobby if you guys would like one. Thank y'all for coming up to the front. I have a few folks that I'd like to invite you to be keeping in your prayers this week. Um, Stephen Washburn uh, is dealing with a bone infection and is going to have to be on IV antibiotics and have a couple of surgeries following that. So please be keeping him in your prayers. Uh, Many of you know that he has quite a number of health struggles. Uh, The Evans family, Scott and Cindy Evans, have been a part of our church for a long time. They will continue to be, but uh, they're closing on their home this week and we'll They'll kind of transition to uh, living mostly in the country, uh, but but we'll be seeing them about once a month or so here on the weekends. So I ask that you keep them in your prayers as they uh, make a big transition this week. And I also wanted to mention Don Bauer. 
Uh, he went in for a procedure this week and ended up having some complications and was in the hospital for several days. He's back home recovering now, but um, he will continue to be recovering for a while. So I ask you to be praying for him as well. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and our hearts as we go to the Lord today. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for the little things that you draw our attention to, for the bright red cardinal singing away that suddenly makes us aware of new mercies. When we see the way they held hands and you made us grateful that we know love, when we see that email between friends and we're moved again by compassion that is shared amongst friends, when we see the latest post and you make us more thirsty again for authentic community. When we see the news and you summon us to be disciples. How clever of you, Lord, to capture our attention through the serendipity of normalcy. I hope, we hope that we don't make you work too hard to capture our attention. Even still, by your grace, help us to never miss you or your calling or your blessing in any of the randomness of our day. Lord, we know that you are always with us, that we are never alone. We don't have to ask for your presence because we know we always have it through the Holy Spirit. We also know, Lord, that we don't always have eyes to see and ears to hear. So open us up to you, Lord. Help us to not only speak to you, but to listen for you. Help us to be willing to lay down whatever perspective we have, whatever position or policy we have. Because nothing matters to us as much as being aligned with your will. Help us to not be um, so zeroed in on the words spoken that we forget to act with kindness and compassion. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us of our sins. We need that cleansing, Lord. We know it. But also, thank you for not only forgiving us from, but forgiving us for. Help us to um, take a step, just dip our toes into your calling for us moment by moment, day by day, knowing that you don't only save us from things, but you save us for things. We want to be the people that you caused us to be born to be. And so give us the joy of our salvation. Return to us the hope of our faith. Help people to see you in us. Help us to see you in others that we would beautifully reflect the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. We pray for our country and its leaders. We ask that you guide them. We pray for our city and ask that you keep um, as many folk around the world healthy and well as possible. We pray for people in uh, poor circumstances who are not able um, to um, do as many things to keep themselves safe. We ask, Lord, that you give us your perspective, the mind of Christ, as we continue through our journey over the coming months, that we would be focused not on problems, but on praise for your faithfulness. We, praise the, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. You know, there are um, meaningless struggles that I have in life. I think many of us do little things that are more annoyances than real problems. Like for me, um, I struggle to light candles with matches. <laughs> like I cannot do it. Uh, I burn my finger every single time, and I usually drop the match, and 
I blame my parents for this completely because they never let me practice because they were convinced that I was so clumsy that I would, I would, they never allowed me to even try it. Uh, they were just certain I was going to burn the house down. So self-fulfilling prophecy. Now I can't do it, right? I cannot for the life of me call the dishwasher by its correct name. At least 80% of the time I say, why haven't you put your dishes in the washing machine? And they just look at me like, um, delicate cycle or permanent press, mom? <laughs> My sister is a great cook, but she cannot make rice. She burns it every single time. One Thanksgiving, we had to clear out of the house due to all the smoke. I mean, just great memories, you know? We all have stupid little things that we struggle with. But then there's also the big stuff. Some folks' big struggle is to just to make it, right, to survive, to keep going paycheck to paycheck. That's a real thing. Some folks' big struggle is getting over themselves. And while I've got many of the garden variety major struggles that many of us deal with, I'd have to say that one of my biggest struggles personally is with always wanting to succeed. I was the teacher's pet in school growing up. I always got the top grades. I was always trying to be good. I always wanted to be the best, even if it meant that you had to put in a whole lot of work in order to get there. I was willing to do it. Student council was the first lesson in this for me. I gave the speech in the school gym like all the other candidates had to give. I did not win the popularity vote that day. So I learned to get where I wanted to go my own way with perseverance. You could either get voted in or you could work like 100 service hours in order to make it in. So there I went. And I learned that if you hit an obstacle, you can find a way around it until you can succeed. I worked the hours. I made it on student council. I was pretty lucky and privileged. Growing up, I got the scholarships that I wanted to get. I got into the college that I wanted to go to. I got the hubby that I wanted. We've worked hard and persevered and made difficult choices along the way, but I was raised with this idea that I could do pretty much anything that I wanted to do, except light a candle, and I kind of believed it. So as my life with God, my faith life, became more and more important and central for me, that desire to be successful just zeroed in on a new target. I wanted to not only be the best student anymore or the best wife or the best friend or whatever, but I also wanted to be the best Christian. And it was a little confusing, I'll admit, because I knew that when it comes to God and Jesus Christ, everything gets flipped upside down. So I knew that in order to be the best Christian, I had to be humble. In order to be first, I had to be last. And somewhere in the middle of all that, I knew that maybe my intentions were not totally in the right place when it came to faith. There was a disconnect somewhere, like maybe I was missing part of the point. But still, that drive to succeed has always been strong. I was going to do it right if I was going to do this faith thing at all. Still today, I find myself from time to time wanting to be a successful Christian. But what does that mean? Unlike many of the other prophets, except for John the Baptist's father, Ezekiel was a priest when he was called as a prophet. His walk with God was already his business, okay, his life's work. He was not pulled from the fields like Amos or from the fishing boat like Peter, he was a professional believer. That was his living. And he knew each and every law and how they were to be carried out. He knew what it took to be a successful Jew. But God gave him a different task. One that I think would have been particularly hard for a man like him. And we're going to go check it out this morning. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to be reading from chapter 3. I'll give you a moment to find it. It's going to be after Psalms and Proverbs, after Isaiah and Jeremiah. So just for a little context, uh, before the great exile out to Babylon, um, there was a group of the most elite elites who were taken out there first. And Ezekiel was a part of that group, okay? 
So not all of Jerusalem has been demolished yet, but he is already in exile, and they know what's coming next. Okay, so we're going to be reading from Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Then God said to me, human one, eat this thing that you have found. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. He said to me, human one, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give you. So I ate it and in my mouth it became sweet as honey. It's like when somebody tells you, I really want you to digest this, okay? Like I really want you to process it. That's kind of uh, the metaphor here. Then he said to me, human one, go, go to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. You aren't being sent to a people whose language and speech are difficult and obscure, but you're being sent to the house of Israel. No, not to many peoples who speak difficult and obscure languages whose words you don't understand. If I did send you to them, they would listen to you. But the house of Israel... They will refuse to listen to you because they refuse to listen to me. The whole house of Israel is hard-headed and hard-hearted too. I've now hardened your face, your head, so that you can meet them head on. I've made your forehead like a diamond, harder than stone. Don't be afraid of them or shrink away from them because they are a household of rebels. He said to me, human one, listen closely and take to heart every word I say to you. Then go to the exiles, to your people's children, whether they listen or not. Speak to them and say, this is what the Lord proclaims. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love this passage. It starts off sounding so good. It's like, look, you're not like Jonah. You're not being sent to foreigners who you can't stand, people who speak a different language. You've got it made. You get to be sent to your own people. You already know them. They know you. Simple, right? But then verses 6 and 7 come along. Look, if I were sending you to foreigners, they would listen. (laughs) They're so in need of God that they would soak it up. But I'm sending you instead to Israel, and they're not going to listen to a single thing you say. They won't listen to you because they're not listening to me. Have no fear. There is no way that you're going to succeed. (laughs) If the job of a prophet is to speak the word of God so that hearts repent and change happens, Ezekiel, I'm just letting you know up front, you are not going to be a success. Wow. God really upsold that little situation, huh? He gives Ezekiel a call, and when you have a call, it's like you can't not do it. Like Jeremiah is saying, I don't really want to be a prophet, but it's like there's this fire in my bones that will not let me go until I've done the thing that God has called me to do. Y'all might remember that verse. God gives Ezekiel that call, and he's a priest, a a religious professional. So of course he wants to succeed. And all the way here in the beginning, in chapter 3, God says, nope, not going to happen. You are not going to be successful. But the other side of that coin, the grace, the huge relief of the moment, is this. God didn't call Ezekiel to be successful. Did you catch that? Verse 11, whether they listen to you or not, Speak to them and say, the Lord proclaims. God is not interested in Ezekiel's success. He's interested in Ezekiel's faithfulness. I gave you something to do. Can you do it? Whether it makes you feel like a success or not. Whether it makes you feel like a failure or not. God does not ask for us to be successful. He asks for us to be what? Faithful, that's right. And if you're an achiever like me, a success addict, those words will hit your ears and sound so stinking deflating. It sounds like what a loser says, not a winner. The thing you say to yourself as a consolation for not being the best. 
It feels like a confession of defeat. Well, it's okay. God didn't want me to be successful anyway, right? But the search for success is not Christian. Do you hear that? It has taken me so long to figure this out, friends. You probably got there much faster than me. It's the part of the puzzle I was missing when I was trying to be a successful Christian. When we're trying to be successful, we ourselves are at the center. We're at the center of that endeavor, that goal, that drive. We are striving. We are working. We are persevering. We, 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 because we are trying to be successful. And we know in those moments when we are not a stranger to ourselves, you and I know deep down in our gut that we are not at the center of our lives, that God is the center of life. And when our goal is faithfulness, then we've aligned all of our gears and allowed our lives to tick perfectly because when we're striving for faithfulness, the goal is just to be near to God who is at the center. To be as close to God in his presence, to reflect him as closely as possible, to be seen as walking as closely to him as can be. We are off center when things are right. And God is full center. So it makes me think of that parable. You remember this one, the farmer who's sowing the seeds, and some of them land on the rocky ground, and some of them land and get eaten up by the birds, and some of them land in the thorns, and some of them land on the good soil. The farmer is not second-guessed or reprimanded for some of the seeds sprouting and some of them not. For the success of his harvest. That's not the point of the parable at all. He's lifted up as a model because he got out there and threw the seed. And I think of the three men, that other parable. One of them is given one talent. Another is given five. The last one's given ten. And they're told to do with it whatever they can. And the one who was given ten used some, took a risk, threw some of it out the window, And was able to gain ten more. And the one who was given five took a risk and came back with double. And the one who had one talent hit it in the ground. And his failure was not a failure to succeed. His failure was a failure to be faithful. Paul wasn't successful every place that he preached the word. It didn't matter. God didn't ask Paul to have a 100% track record. He asked Paul to be faithful. If you feel the burden in your life of not being as successful as you once hoped to be, I want to encourage you, sister, (laughs) to you, just to lay that on down. Because God never asked you to be. God's only request is that you're faithful. And this teaching of the Lord's friends, it's also true when it comes to our finances. If there's one place where we want to be successful people, it's with money. (laughs) We want to prepare well for our older years. We want to do what we can financially for our children. We want to be successful financially, but God never asked us to be. He just asked us to be what? Faithful with our finances. And like Ezekiel who was given a forehead like diamond, I love this, made as stubborn as a mule, God gives us that kind of strength too to continue to be faithful with our finances even when things are not coming up roses, even when we're not feeling successful. The farmer doesn't keep the seed and hoard it for another day when things are looking better. He throws it out, taking a chance without any certainty of how it's going to end up. He releases it into the wind and trusts. The two men, the one with the five and the one with the ten, they had to spend some of their employer's wealth in order to gain more. There is no guarantees of success. You just step out in faith and you trust. With our blessings box this year, when we give food from our own pantries and we place it in the box, we don't know who's going to take it or how badly they need it. Or whether they could take less, they take less than they should, or whether they take more than they should. We just step out in faith and trust that God's going to work it out. 
The whole year has been like that. For each one of us individually, I think, but also I know for sure for our church as a whole, for Asbury, no one could tell us if any of the things that we tried this year were going to be successful because no one had tried to do ministry like this in a year like this. And it was kind of freeing because that, that fear of like, oh, I don't know if this is going to be successful, it could either paralyze you or it could catalyze you. If you know that somewhere along the way you're going to make a mistake, okay, you accept that, then you can try anything. And we knew God was not going to hold us to account for how successful our efforts were this year. On the other hand, you better believe he's going to hold us to account to how faithful we were. So we looked at our discipleship pathway, and we said, okay, we know God is calling us to be faithful to him through worship, growth, serving and sharing. Those are the only things we're going to care about this year. He will hold us accountable to whether we have helped people live into these practices as disciples or not. So this is our focus. And it led us to reimagine worship for people both far and near. And it caused us to make our small groups more accessible so anyone can participate in them. As you probably know, not only did that allow us to keep the ones that we already had, but we added four more this year. And it caused us to serve through our ongoing and brand new missions initiatives from our blessings box to stocking the shelves to our book initiative with PISV. This resulted in 83% more people serving in mission this past year than the year before. And we had an explosion of sharing the good news through online ministry unlike anything in our church's history. And we baptized seven new believers into the faith. This is God's work through you, through Asbury, because we pursued not success, but just plain old faithfulness. Two weeks ago, um, a church family came into my office to give a generous financial gift. During our conversation, they told me some of the story of their lives. The gentleman was sitting next to his wife of something like, 50 years of marriage or more and he always refers to her as his girlfriend it's the cutest thing I love it and he said when he and his girlfriend were first married they attended a church but they couldn't really give they were in such a tight situation financially he told me he didn't start giving to God through the church until he became the church treasurer if anything will convince you of how much you need to give I can tell you that'll do it um And he said that's the time when they started giving $25 a month. And they were clipping coupons at home in order to be able to do that. At the time, $25 a month seemed like an extraordinary, abundant amount. And he was never sure whether they were going to be able to make it or not. So he told me something fascinating. In January of each year, he wrote a $25 check For each month, he wrote 12 of them and dated them for each month and kept it in a folder. It was a step of faith with a backup plan. He wouldn't give it until that month came, just in case something came up. But his intention from the very first day of the year was to step out in faith and assume that he would. He said, Lindsay, it was the oddest thing. But over time, it became obvious the more we gave, the more we received. Back to that whole promise of the fact that you can never outgive God that we talked about last week, right? So here they were, years later, sitting in my office, handing over a generous gift. And if he hadn't seen God's faithfulness proven so many times before, he indicated that he would have been as surprised as anyone that he'd be, you know, at this point in his life and able to be in the position he was in that day. But they had learned along the way that their goal was not to be financially successful, but to be financially faithful. And since you can never outgive God, it just happened to lead them to a place of generosity that they couldn't have imagined back in the days of clipping coupons in order to give to the offering. For those of you who are ready to not only worship Christ and hopefully grow in Christ and serve Christ, but who are also ready to do the sharing your gifts with Christ part of being a disciple, I want to invite you to make a financial pledge today. Many people give to the church without making a pledge, and there's nothing wrong with that approach. But the reason I find making a pledge helpful myself 
is because it requires the act of sharing your gift, gifts to be an act of faith because you're committing to something despite the uncertainties of the future, despite knowing how the year is going to work out. And there's great value in that for our own walk with the Lord, imbuing every part of our lives with leaps of faith. It's something you're invited to do for your own spiritual growth, not primarily for the benefit of the church. Of course, if you ever need to adjust your pledge, you can always do so by notifying the church office manager. If you're in the sanctuary today, you can take a moment to place your pledge card in the offering plate. If you're at home, you can either mail us your pledge card or you can go right now to asbury.cc slash pledge and fill out a secure commitment card online. I'm grateful for these teachings of God that free us from the bonds of worry to realize that nothing is mine anyway. Everything is God's. To experience the promise that we can never outgive God, no matter how much we give, God gives more. And to take the weight of success, the image of what that is, always being subjective, always growing in proportion to our need for increased self-worth, to de decenter ourselves, take success off the table and replace it with a goal, a drive for faithfulness instead. There is so much freedom there, friends, if we'll just take the leap knowing that God will catch us. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for uh, this teaching from Ezekiel. For those of us who um, always want to be successful, Lord, I pray that over time you would direct our hearts to a better goal or more um, God-honoring goal. Help us, Lord, to switch that uh, voice in our head from wanting to be successful to wanting to be faithful. And Lord, we thank you for the offering that we are about to receive today, for all the ways that um, you use these gifts to make a difference in our community, in our church, and in the world. We thank you also for the commitments that are going to be shared today, Lord. I pray that you give us uh, comfort as we take a step out into the unknown. Um, knowing that, once again, you're going to be proven faithful to us, just like you always are. We thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You're welcome to give your offering um, and your commitments to the Lord at this time. <laughs>
Would you please join us in singing our closing hymn? If you're at home, please join us. If you're in the sanctuary, please remain standing. Um, here I am, Lord. Well, friends, it's been so good to worship with you today. I hope you have a wonderful week ahead of you, that you're searching for God's blessings and his presence and his work in your life, and that you're able to celebrate that with the people around you. Um, I look forward to connecting with you this week during scripture moments and prayer times, and look forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday. Whether you're here in the sanctuary or worshiping from home, I hope that you will share today's worship service um, on Facebook uh, so that other people can worship along with us today. But as we go from here, remember God goes before you to show you the way, behind you to keep you moving, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, and within you always to give you peace. Amen. Y'all please be seated and the ushers will help you out the doors. <laughs>